So, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I think you can. Now it's coming. Yes, hello. Um, welcome to this year's um, Parliamentarian Roundtable. My name is Thomas Schneider. I work for the Swiss government and I'm uh, delighted to, to act as a moderator here. So this is not about me, I'm just the, the facilitator for our discussion with parliamentarians, but not only among parliamentarians, but as you see also with, with some other um, people that play a role when it comes to digital governance. Um, the parliamentarian track is something that has emerged over the years uh, at the IGF because people have realized that it is not only governments, civil society, business, and the technical community that has a role and should be present, but also parliamentarian as parliamentarians, as they have a crucial role, of course, in setting, create, making the rules for our societies when it comes not only, but also to, of course, digital governance. And this year's, this year's parliamentarian track has, like, like the previous years, a series of events. This is just one of them. And it's focusing around shaping digital trust and the role that parliaments and parliamentarians and the legislative per se has in, in all of this. And of course, we know that trust is, is fundamental for all digital issues, but it's particularly fundament, fundamental uh, if we deal with new technologies like uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence systems, but also when it comes to data, because data is, is an important uh, resource, but without trust, it is difficult to use data. Okay, so we are, we are not yet ready. Okay, so we need to slow down and uh, wait for the setting to be. So you give me a sign when you're ready? Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, we tried to be on time. <laughs> okay, so we can have a look at the audience <laughs> and enjoy the nice view of people smiling and uh, talking to each other, looking into their computers and uh, waiting for the session to continue. Will, will the voice from God introduce the exactly. We're all wondering what kind of music that Vin Cerf is having on his headphones. Oh. <laughs> but it's uh, still hippie music from the early 70s uh, from <laughs> California. No, actually, no. no. Uh, is it algorithms? Yeah. No, I prefer music published prior to 1850. Prior to, Pri 1850. Prior to 1850, yes. I'm a classicist. Okay. And so anything after 1850, I'm not interested in. That explains why so, there's uh, a logic in the, in like, the internet you that you co-created because the, you've been listening to the, music that also follows a logic. This is the march of the gods into Valhalla. <laughs> Thanks, Vint, for, for this enlightenment. <clears throat> so are we ready? Not yet, so, um, yeah. <clears throat> this is a really nice venue, it's a really nice architecture. It's my first time here in Japan, so uh, I'm quite enjoying it. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Or maybe we can still start so that if the remote people miss the. Is it okay? Yes, okay, so welcome back. <laughs> to this uh, parliamentarian roundtable that is, as I said, focusing this year on, in particular on shaping, strengthening, earning digital trust, which is even more fundamental with new technologies like using AI systems and also like using data where people only share data when they trust that nothing bad happens to their data and then also to themselves. So having said this, I will not lose much time and actually will move on to introducing our first speakers. And we start 
with uh, Under Secretary General Li Junghua, which will open up the panel with a few remarks. Under Secretary General from uh, UNDESA. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Good afternoon. Um, dear parliamentarians, distinguished members, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome you to this uh, parliamentary track round table this afternoon at the IGF 2023. Your focus this year on a shaping digital trust is a very timely was the internet and digital technologies increasingly shaping our economies and societies, it is, crucial, it is crucially important that the policy makers help to shape the digital landscape that reflects people's aspirations and secures their rights, including the respect of privacy. We cannot afford the fragmented national approaches to the data governance that leaves space for exclusion and um, misalignment with our global goals. With the growing digitalization of the global economy and the speed and the speed with which new technologies are absorbed in our daily lives, we need to ensure that technology is deployed following a human-centric approach and according to our shared values. Policy, laws, and regulations should facilitate the collaboration to develop the new and immersive technologies like the artificial intelligence in a trusted way while continuing to foster innovations. And we need to create a digital space that curbs the reach of the online misinformation and disinformation, securing the internet as a tool for individual and collective empowerment. What distinguished parliamentarians, distinguished guests, distinguished delegates. As, as lawmakers in your various jurisdictions, you can take the key message and the recommendations from those global level discussions to the regional and the national levels and work with stakeholders to build a structure of the internet governance that uplifts and empowers all peoples. You can also help to minimize the risks associated with digitalization to ensure that the individuals can enjoy its benefits in an inclusive, safe, and secure manner. I invite you to strengthen your engagement with IGF across the, its various sessions and the focused areas, and consider the work carried out in these forums as resources for your national parliamentary discussions and activities. I wish you to continue to have a fruitful exchanges and look forward to hearing your recommendations. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Undersecretary General. Next, we do have uh, somebody connected online. It is Ms. Jehan Mahmoud, Minister of Parliament of the Maldives and a member of the Bureau of the Interparliamentary Union Standing Committee on Democracy and Human Rights. I hope you are connected. I hope you can hear me. Yes, welcome. Distinguished members of parliament, panelists, IGF participants, Honorable Okushima, it, is often, it often feels that trust is in short supply. Polling data from all regions show levels of trust in politics are not very high. Yet in the political domain as elsewhere, trust is absolutely essential. People need to be able to trust that elections are free and fair People need to be able to trust in their representatives 
to act responsibly on their behalf. For parliamentarians, public trust is, const is a constant preoccupation. We know from firsthand experience that trust has to be built over time. Agreed rules, well-functioning institutions, and ethical behavior are just some of the key ingredients to building this trust. For this reason, it is very important that today we are focusing on a trusted internet, a safe digital environment. I would like to draw attention to three areas that are of ongoing concern to the IPU. One is online violence, especially including violence towards women and children and also including in the political sphere. We simply cannot allow online violence to go unchallenged. We need to stand together to say that online violence is unacceptable and to take the legal and technical measures to combat violence. Take the legal and technical measures to combat violence online with as much vigor as we do offline. The internet must be a safe space for everyone, including and especially children. Another area of concern is elections, of course, and specifically attempts to influence or interfere with the electoral, electoral, um, electoral process. This is happening around the world, not only in the largest countries, even in really, really small countries such as Maldives, where I come from. The new ways in which information circulates and the new opportunities for micro-targeting audiences challenge us all. We must do more to safeguard the integrity of elections. The legitimacy of our governments and our parliaments, our elections depend upon it. Lastly, artificial intelligence which has emerged into the public consciousness with such force in recent months. The potential benefits are enormous. The potential risks are also. How do we as lawmakers, technical experts, civil society come together to build um, a framework for development and use artificial intelligence that the public can trust? This is one of the key questions of our times, our age. Even as technology itself continues to evolve at a rapid pace. For parliaments, it is very important to be present here at the Internet Governance Forum and to be part of the ongoing exchange between stakeholders at national, regional and international levels. We bear a heavy responsibility for creating the legal framework and as guardians of human rights of all citizens. We need to ensure that all voices are heard so that we can take actions that will build a trusted internet. I'm certain that the debates that are taking place at IGF this week will continue with the IPU, within the IPU and in our national parliaments. Thank you, wishing you all a very fruitful forum. Thank you very much, Jehan. Next, we have a, a member of parliament of the host country of Japan, Tomoko Ukishima. Please go to the lectern, thank you.皆様こんにちは。私は衆議院総務委員長の浮島智子でございます。日本の国会議員を代表して、そして情報通信政策を取り扱う衆議院総務委員長の長として パーラメンタリートラックへの参加を心より歓迎いたします。主催である国連及びIPUの皆様におかれましては、本会合のためにこれまてご尽力をいただき、大変にありがとうございます。心より感謝を申し上げます。まず、2023年の 
IGF ホスト国としてオープンで自由な信頼できるインターネットの推進のためにマルチテクステークホルダーが一堂に会して議論できる機会を提供できることを喜ばしく思います。IGF にはハイレベルセッションやワークショップ、デイゼロプレイイベントなど、多様なオーガナイザーが企画するセッションがございます。その中でも、パーラメンタリートラックは、インターネットの利用、発展およびガバナンスや関連するデジタル技術についての重要な課題について、各国会議員の間でグッドプラクティスの共有、その解決策についての議論、さらには他のステークホルダーとの対話を通じて、効果的で効率的な政策を実施するための機会となっております。ここでの議論の成果は、各国インターネット政策に広く貢献するものです。今年のパーラメンタリートラックのメインテーマは、私たちの望むインターネットのためのデジタルトラストです。形成です。特に国際社会にとって重要な3つのテーマ、1つ目、データガバナンス、2つ目、AI、そして3つ目は、偽情報を議論いたします。これらは、今年日本がホストを務めた G7 デジタル技術大臣会合においても議論がなされたところでもございます。これらのテーマは、デジタルデバイトへの対処しながら、どのように信頼できる接続性を担保するか。AI が社会経済に与えるリスクを軽減しつつ、いかにして人類に対する恩恵の最大化を図るかというより広い議論も含んでいるところであります。特に AI については、G7 広島サミットの結果を踏まえ、本年5月に広島 AI プロセスを立ち上げました。年末に向けて、本プロセスを通じて、すべての AI 開発者に向けての国際的な指針等の策定に取り組むこととしておりますが、その過程におけるマルチステークホルダーとの意見交換の重要性について、すべての G7 メンバーが認識を共有しているところであります。私は IGF ・パーラメンタリートラックがより広いステークホルダーの声を聞く、貴重な機会になるものと思っております。これらの重要なテーマについての活発な議論を、私も楽しみにしています。最後に、本日の会合の成功を心のように記念し、挨拶とさせていただきます。ありがとうございました。Something we have in common. He's、uh, had several roles. I'm just mentioning his latest and very important one. He's the chairman of the leadership panel of the IGF Windsurf. Please, you have the floor. I'm always nervous when people clap before you've said anything. <laughs> you should probably just sit down because it won't get any better than that. Uh, well, I address you as a technologist in awe of the parliamentarians who have been given the impossible task of discovering productive rules for bringing discipline to the complex technologies and applications of the internet and computer based systems. I do not envy you your task, but I hope I can help it. One of the key features of the internet and computer based systems is their ability to amplify whatever it is we do. And we see this in the form of rapid distribution of content around the world, access to、uh, materials, a megaphone to people whose voices might otherwise not be heard, which is very important. But then they also, voices that we don't want to listen to are equally amplified. And that is a challenge. How do we discipline that? I must warn the legislators that you can make laws, but you're not allowed to revise the laws of physics. So, if you ask the engineers to do double the speed of light in aid of your legislation, we will have to disappoint you. However, the legislators are trying to fashion the rules of what I will say is a 21st century social contract. 
as citizens of each country and citizens of the world, as netizens in the internet, uh, we wish for a social contract in which the rules of behavior allow us to feel safe and secure in this online environment. So it's very important for the parliamentarians to appreciate both the capabilities and the weaknesses of computer-based applications. So the technologists have an obligation to the parliamentarians to help them understand in some fundamental way how these systems work and how they don't work. What the experts should do is to help inform the thinking of the, the uh, parliamentarians in fashioning rules that will achieve the objectives of the social contract. So our targets generally are trust and safety and security and privacy and accountability and agency and a long list of other desirable properties of legislation. One thing I would urge the parliamentarians to do is to focus on outcomes rather than on specific technologies. Just at the moment, we are mesmerized by artificial intelligence and machine learning and large language models. But I believe that that is in some sense a distraction. What we should be most concerned about is how these systems are being used. What, is it, what are the effects and side effects of their use? Are there harms that we need to defend against? Uh, Mr. Moderator, with your permission, I would like to open up one other topic which you probably or may not be expecting, but I, this is to give the parliamentarians fair warning that you have an open territory that is upon us within the next couple of years uh, to uh, consider, and that is the expansion of the Internet into interplanetary space. It is well underway. The head of the uh, interplanetary networking chapter of the Internet Society is here with us, Yosuke Kaneko, who is part of JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. He's just released on our behalf a report describing what an interplanetary internet would look like and what its implications are. I want you to think for a moment about the return to the moon, the Artemis missions, uh, which involve the cooperative efforts of the European Space Agency the Japanese Space Agency, the Korean Space Agency, and, and of course NASA in the US. When the return to the moon happens, which is coming within the next two years, there will be commercial activity on the moon. There are all kinds of implications of that commercial activity, which have only been considered in very uh, modest terms, like the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Now I realize, Mr. Moderator, this is super far out, but the problem is it's only two years away. And so I want to make sure that you are conscious of the fact that we will have to cope with questions like, can you own property on the moon? If NASA is willing to purchase the results of mining on the moon, then the question is, where you know, do you get to own the mine? What if there's a dispute about ownership? Where does that get resolved? What if there's a claim jumper? Uh, do we have a space police force? I mean, these are all questions that are going to come up in the context of the expansion into space, and the Internet will be there along with it, and it will bring its own set of challenges. So if it weren't enough to deal with the terrestrial Internet, by the time that we have the 2024 and 2025 uh, IGFs, I am, er, su suspect that that topic will be on the agenda as well. So thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. I turn this back to you. Thank you very much, Wint. And thank you for uh, telling us that our lives will become even more complicated. But at least that means that uh, when uh, the IGF will be prolonged by the UN General Assembly in 25, we will have IGFs uh, 26, 7, 8 on, March, on Mars, on Venus, and on Jupiter. And uh, we'll just need to find out who exactly will then host the, the IGFs there. Um, but we'll definitely <laughs> look, we are looking forward to meet you again on Jupiter in 27. I'm sure the Martian delegation will be in touch with us soon. <laughs> Thank you very much for these enlightening uh, remarks by all the four of you. Um, I would now like to uh, invite you to... Uh, make way for the free parliamentarians that will come up here 
um, that will um, try and interact with me and with you on uh, three questions that we think are in the core, or at least some, some relevant questions when it comes to, and we've heard uh, about the challenges, but at the same time, the important role of parliamentarians. So we have uh, Honorable Sumana Shrestha. She's a member from Parliament of Nepal. We have Honorable Latifa Al Abdul Karim, Shura Council member from Saudi Arabia. And we have Honorable Brando Benifei, member of the European Parliament. Please welcome, thank you. So maybe we start with a question to uh, the outer space regulation that is underway in your countries. But I, I really tend to think that uh, Vint is, is actually right because we're seeing, of course, lots more activities uh, with and around satellites. And, and I guess this is an issue that will keep us busy uh, in many ways in, in the years to come. So, um, yeah, we're well, looking forward to that. But let's, let's stay with with uh, traditional things like artificial intelligence and so on for the time being, because this is easy enough for us all <laughs> to, to try and cope with. So my first question to you would be, uh, knowing that uh, legislators are key actors developing the legislation that should contribute to a trustworthy digital space as well as it does to a trustworthy analog space, the question is how can we improve regulatory capacity and how can we develop, and this is one of the key words, agile government governance measures to keep up with the rapid pace of technology? So um, maybe we start just, we can switch orders in the next questions, but we start uh, with you, Latifa. Please. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Tom, Thomas, and uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, and yes, well, let's come from the space maybe now <laughs> to the earth and uh, prepare for the space. Um, I personally uh, strongly believe that uh, technology shouldn't be regulated in the same legacy regulatory practice that we are used to be. We cannot really uh, have a rigid regulation. So definitely we need to prepare for innovative um, uh, regulation uh, methodologies. Regulators should be in the loop of developing the systems. They, they shouldn't work in isolation from uh, the practice that we are, are having today. Uh, in order to have successful, uh, I would say, um, regulation, I shouldn't expect any uh, regulator to stay in the office and just write some AI rules and doesn't really know what's, what's happening uh, in the practice. So uh, in order to know um, or to, to reach a good practice uh, that makes regulation really effective and uh, efficient, then we need iterative, uh, multi-stakeholder, agile, innovative regulation. What do I mean by this? taking in consideration the economic dimension in order to bring responsible innovation. We need to address all uh, uh, the uncertainty, the gaps between the regulations, and uh, making sure that the new regulation is adaptable to the new standards that we will face while the technology is developing. Um, and also, these kind of approaches will bring out the trust that we are, that we're really targeting for the users and for the business as well. Uh, if I have time, I might, I might uh, uh, like uh, elaborate more on this as parliamentarian. Then, so what are the, our rules as parliamentarian? Two main rules, uh, two main roles that we have: uh, writing the proposals or proposing a new laws and new regulations, reviewing and amending laws. How can that be uh, happened within the uh, parliament? Um, definitely we need a strategy. As parliamentarian, we need to prepare a multi-stakeholder group between different committees uh, with different backgrounds and prepare a, a roadmap or plan a roadmap uh, starting from the priorities and starting from asking ourselves the questions like what exactly Technology, the technology that we need to reg regulate and how to reg regulate it and why do we need to regulate it and make sure from 
answering these questions that we are reaching coherence between the regulations that we are planning to have. Maybe the other role is the over oversight. So oversighting the uh, responsible bodies, the responsible uh, like one or more bodies to make sure that they are also moving in parallel with the, the long-term regulation that we are targeting. So we have short-term work and long-term work. So, so the short-term work is making sure that in the practice, we have regulatory uh, sandboxes. We are monitoring the adoption of uh, the principles and the uh, data policies, the cybersecurity, and monitoring the compliance of all these. And in addition, maybe something that I want to highlight is we need a new approach in order to know the standards of um, those new technologies. So having the call for policy labs within the innovation centers, so we can monitor the progress of the development of the new use cases that entrepreneurs and other companies are really developing. I think I exceeded my time, so I will <laughs> move to you, Suman. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think there are four folds to understanding or answering your question. First is to recognize the last part, which is technology really is developing at a very rapid pace, and regulators or policymakers end up somehow catching up most of the time, which means we need uh, to have a resource pool. What I mean by that is a knowledge pool of academia, of researchers, of early adopters who can quickly then identify here are the risks you need to step in and regulate. I think that is the first part. And then really having plan A, B, C, D, E, F all the way, however long it takes to iteratively then come up with policies that truly keeps it safe. Uh, the second is to recognize and really advocate for the unique conditions our countries are in and really to ask for support from in platforms like this to come up with global frameworks that then can be contextualized to our specific needs. The third would be, um, again, recognizing the constraints under which our countries operate. For example, do we really, does Nepal really have um, the platform to uh, monitor or regulate really t large tech companies? Uh, what would be some of the best ways to keep everybody safe, right? So then it would really be coming up with basic minimum standards across the world, across the boundaries, to keep children safe, um, to have basic literacy programs like a pop-up that comes up when somebody is trying to interact with uh, technology or in digital space. And finally, the third would be sessions like this where we learn from each other and we replicate the best practices. We learn from each other's mistakes so that we're not reinventing the wheels. Thank you. Well, the question has been uh, largely, largely answered, but I can uh, add a few points. Um, we can say that um, um, there is always a tension between trying to co-legislate, uh, co uh, talking and taking into account, and I can say that uh, by looking at this, uh, this place and this conference, this uh, uh, context we are in, uh, by involving all the stakeholders and, and trying to um, uh, be able to deliver uh, our uh, uh, legislation, keep it the pace with the technological change by being strongly connected with those that do uh, act on the market, on, on the development of, uh, of the technological products, if we talk specifically about that. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that, however, this needs to be done with the care of the fact that uh, 
uh, there are uh, vested interests, there are um, also uh, elements of power, uh, especially when we look at, uh, again, technology and technological legislation, um, we need to consider um, the imbalances of power that are there. And so we need to uh, be able to uh, maintain enough uh, autonomy and also understand understand in the various contexts which are the strong points, we can say, of each uh, context. For example, if you can uh, uh, use also your market power or some forms of soft power to build um, a, a, a stronger position when you uh, try to implement legislation. Because the point is we, we cannot just, uh, especially in this area, we cannot just uh, say we want uh, to approve uh, uh, legislative texts or uh, rules. We need to be sure that they can be implemented. So you, ne you need to look at the governance and the enforcement. Um, and this means also that you need to uh, understand the best way not to be obsolete when you uh, work on, on this uh, area. And so um, I really, and I just conclude on, on this, I, I, I keep it brief, um, the, um, I, I think it was very, very punctual, very correct what we heard before by um, Mr. Serf about the need to concentrate on um, uh, the use of uh, uh, the technology, the areas where they are used uh, in the case of the artificial intelligence, for example, on which I, I'm working, especially the so-called use cases, rather than the technology itself. In my opinion, it's not always possible, but it c needs to be a, a rather an exception than the rule. The rule should be to look at how concretely each technology impacts and it's used so that in this way already we know we can be more future-proof in our, in our work. Thank you very much. So, so what I'm hearing from all of you is the need for interdisciplinary, multi-stakeholder interaction, exchange, learning from each other, um, which, which makes a lot of sense because also parliamentarians are not necessarily experts in all the technology when, when they are elected, but of course you have to gather knowledge if you try to yeah, develop reasonable uh, legislation that is supposed to, to deliver on, on many fronts. Um, the question is, uh, actually the next one is, is, is adding up to this, is given that we all want to strengthen the cooperation across different stakeholders, governments, industry, experts from civil society, academia, and the parliament, but how do you do this? How do you do this in your country? How do you get your personal networks together? How do you get the knowledge that you need in order to, to legislate? How does it work in, 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 in your specific uh, uh, surroundings and what what can be done to be improved now let's let's start from the other end <laughs> and the okay. next one will take well from the well i have to say that the the model of the european parliament in this sense is uh, is interesting because we um, uh, build a lot of occasions uh, to uh, discuss uh, and to prepare our work. I, I give you an example. On artificial intelligence, um, we uh, have been um, uh, preparing the legislative work we are doing now, on which I know many are also looking with interest. I was talking with the colleagues before the debate. Uh, we got there to do legislation after more than one year of a special committee that was studying the subject from many different perspectives. And it was uh, uh, an occasion and a place of uh, uh, debate uh, with uh, uh, academia, with stakeholders of all kinds, uh, of uh, uh, representatives of, uh, of uh, uh, various uh, um, also uh, international organizations, etc. It has been extremely useful because it gave also uh, the parliamentarians the necessary uh, perspective to uh, work on uh, such complex matters uh, on a legislative uh, uh, form. So I, I, I think the experiences could be different, but I, I, I think it's very important that there is some uh, 
programming and some uh, investment in the time we have. What do I mean? And, and, and I will be brief on this point. I mean that uh, you, you know that parliamentary terms uh, have a certain length and it's important that there is uh, uh, enough time used to uh, get deeper into the subject before decisions are taken. Unfortunately, sometimes there is a, a pressure due to electoral reasons or due to uh, urgencies that happen. But uh, much, most of the time, if we do not uh, reflect uh, uh, in, in the correct timing before we take the decisions and we involve all the stakeholders in our discussions, then we take the wrong decisions and we need to correct after. So I think this is something that is very important to invest in, to have the right timing for each phase to prepare and then enact uh, and also make it effective when we, we, we talk about uh, certain pieces of, of legislation. I think you've hit the jackpot of the question is how do you elaborate and implement on the policies that you make, right? I feel if every developing country could implement everything that's written, I don't think there would be a term called developing countries to begin with. I think that's where the rubber hits the road. And I think before we start the conversation of cooperation, it starts with this topic of trust. How do you build trust across all these stakeholders that then truly enables a open-hearted cooperation and maybe even collaboration? So I think it's the first step is this recognition that when everybody is working towards optimally using digital technologies to interact in a digitally safe space, that is the utopia that we are all aiming for. That is the time when our elections are truly fair. That's the time when a lot of what duplications are removed and we are optimally allocating resources, right? Um, the second is to really import, um, realize that in order to elaborate and, Im and implement these policies that you know, we can make the best and best policies is this question of capacity. Do we have the human capacity to actually get this done? And then comes this fundamental question that I believe ails a lot of developing countries, including Nepal, which is this mass migration of really educated people, which then leaves us with really good policies but no ability to set up uh, regulatory bodies that can then implement or set up a very vibrant ecosystem where things are institutionalized. And finally, I think the cornerstone of strengthening would be um, institutionalizing the effort that we've started, such that, again, it goes a bit towards what I said earlier, is then building on to the network that we have, building on to the knowledge that we've accumulated, and then responding very fast with the knowledge pool that we can collectively tap on um, to really strengthen the cooperation. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, and I would like to add on the top of uh, my colleagues' uh, points. Um, they mentioned the stakeholders, they mentioned the need of collaboration, so I would like to add something else. I will not review what they have already said. Uh, the power of using the AI tools in the parliament. This is something that we didn't tackle before, and it's really very helpful. Uh, talking, taking from my, uh, talking from my experience, I'm uh, a professor in AI and law, so I uh, really working on those kind of uh, legal uh, analysis uh, using using some AI tools. So we need to apply those tools and and to help us in summarizing those laws, to help in, in uh, finding times and when when you have very uh, limited time to uh, understand many things, uh, understand summarizing those uh, legal uh, uh, legislations in general and uh, comparing between them. Uh, and on the top of uh, the other the other side of the question, when you said the, the collaboration between the government, so. Um, in the parliament, as a Shura Council member, we have a very strong collaboration with governments, with, sorry, with parliaments, and uh, across like 150 uh, countries. 
um, with, uh, within our friendship committees. So we are meeting those parliaments and we are discussing and sharing practices and uh, collaborate on uh, the level of the economic impact and social impacts of cybersecurity on the data flow, uh, free flow, and uh, on the uh, AI risks and data policies and principles. So these kinds of collaboration and meetings and dialogues helps us a lot in sharing uh, um, like best practices and helping each other in order to uh, forming those uh, new regulations. Um, also, as a member, um, Saudi Parliament is a member of the IPU, of course, and uh, we are always engaging in the uh, dialogues, the global dialogues. A few weeks ago, we are in the uh, Uruguay discussing the World, Second World Summits of Future Committees. Uh, and uh, mainly, uh, we, are, we were focusing on the AI governance and the AI regulations, the challenges, including uh, the discussions with the uh, representatives from the business and um, uh, civil society and academ academia. So what I'd like to recommend uh, on this side is increasing this kind of parliamentary track within different venues of uh, technology, especially in AI now. And uh, uh, this is what we mean by regulator in the loop. We have to be a parliamentary track in those loops. And uh, I have heard yesterday from uh, the parliamentary session the need for the developing countries to really exchange the practice. So maybe this is something for IPU to help in uh, uh, having our providing those resources, our access to those resources regarding their AI acts, data principles, data policies, and uh, AI governance standards and uh, other frameworks that will help into also sharing uh, uh, knowledge between the countries. Um, one thing more that we need to consider is to um, bring out the AI readiness between the countries. And we, uh, when we are talking about the AI readiness, we are talking about the balance between the regulation side and the business side. So these are like the, some of the things that I would I would like to see in the future uh, of this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, uh, I think uh, cooperation is the key. Relying on experts is, is one element. Talking to each other across, across nation is, is, is nations is another element. Um, and actually that hooks to the, to the next question. Um, talking to each other is fine, but then uh, the question is to what extent is, is it necessary or possible to align safety standards across regions, countries and industries to, to build trust in a, in a, let's say, through interoperability or harmonization, knowing that you are elected by people in one country that do not necessarily care about what happens in another country but but so how do you how do you think we can strengthen shared standards not only legal standards but also technical and other standards so that we have a certain level on the global level of harmonization with, with standards with with minimal requirements for safety and security and, and other values regarding uh, digital technologies not only AI but and also since data is something that does not necessarily stay within borders but can be easily moved. So how do you, what is needed in terms of cooperation across country borders from a parliamentarian point of view in order to build that trust in digital technology through parliaments as well? Thank you. I think the key really is in realizing um, what I said earlier, which is when the digital uh, space is safe for everyone, then we truly are better off. Then it's a win-win situation for every country, every, every person in the world. Um, so starting from that view, then I think there is a lot that's possible. Uh, one of the key, key area that I would like to highlight is in being generous uh, with sharing knowledge and technology. For example, I'm sure there are some organizations, some corporations, some companies, some academia, some researcher um, in some part of the world, most likely developed part of the world, that are coming up with algorithms to detect deep fakes. So technology or knowledge like that 
would then, if it's available um, in low resource setting, those are the times we can truly um, collectively tackle misinformation, disinformation. Um, that separates us, that, that divides us. So a generous um, view that we need to share our knowledge, share technology to keep everyone safe would be, I think, instrumental. The second would be to realize uh, while there are common minimum standards um, that we can agree to when it comes to writing codes, how we uh, store, work with digital public goods, I think the other one is to realize that every technology needs to be adapted um, to different uh, country, to even within different country, to different uh, locality. So it's very important to contextualize technology. To give a very simple example, um, the digital literacy, no matter what kind of technology you build, if the human being interacting with that technology, it does, it's just like saying, it doesn't matter how complicated password you, you use, if you just write it in a piece of paper and stick it to your computer, it does not work, right? So I think it's important to recognize the level of digital literacy that, it, that it's in a spectrum. So it's very important that we work on helping each other also contextualize. And it could be as simple as a pop-up that comes up whenever we interact uh, with large tech that says, all right, do not believe everything you read, you see in the internet. As simple as that, right? So those are, I think, some of the, we need to agree to certain minimum standards that we hold all of us accountable to. Um, it could be, uh, questions like what are some of the non-negotiables when it comes to keeping the minors protected? And I think EU has done a fantastic job that we can really learn from. So the, once those minimum standards are set and we agree to, um, I'm hoping globally every company, every organization that's working in this space will also adhere to those minimum standards. And then on top of that, we really contextualize um, on these um, for every locality and we contextualize to make sure our technologies are really people-centric for whom it's designed to be. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, if we talk about uh, a trustful uh, internet and an open space uh, and uh, if we look at AI, or other technologies that we are discussing in this in this context, it's clear that cooperation is crucial because simply some uh, issues cannot be uh, dealt with uh, domestically. They need to uh, find uh, a, a, a global cooperation space. However, I think it's important not to confuse the um, the levels of what we are talking about because. Uh, there are uh, um, issues, there are risks, there are problems, and the relative opportunities, if uh, risks are confronted, that are uh, inherently domestic. They are linked to uh, daily lives of people, and they need to be uh, uh, um, dealt with with legislation that is protecting uh, safety, health, uh, fundamental rights, by looking uh, at uh, uh, the concrete uh, uh, daily use of technologies. Uh, while, for sure, the global cooperation is uh, fundamental and inevitable, if we look at more larger, we can say, systemic risks of uh, uh, cybersecurity, of, um, even of geopolitical kind, but also of uh, um, the need to have common definitions, common standards, common understanding of what we are doing. Uh, international organizations are crucial, like where we are and with the UN, but also uh, other uh, uh, fora where uh, this is being discussed. We heard Prime Minister Kishida talking about the Hiroshima uh, process, that it's uh, very important on the generative AI, but uh, uh, this uh, can be applied to the internet and, and, and to much more. And in fact, we have seen that um, we can learn from each other. We can see that uh, on some decisions, for example, on data protection or 
on um, uh, what we ask the platforms uh, to do, uh, we see that we learn from each other. I've seen that something we have done in Europe uh, was discussed and partially adopted in other places, and we could also learn by the new versions of what has been decided, also how to do better where it has originally uh, uh, fought as in the first place. We, we are seeing this happening, and I think this is uh, very important, that we, we, we um, uh, work in this direction. And to be honest, I think that the parliamentarians are especially um, uh, able to do this uh, well and to orientate and push in the right directions the, the executive branches, which are less apt to look at the need of the individual person because they have another uh, perspective necessarily, while the parliamentarian is able to look at the uh, impact on the individual, which I think is very important in this moment when we look uh, at the developments of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, new uh, technologies, both in the area of the internet in general and in AI that has been a lot discussed in this, uh, in this context. Thank you. Um, I would like to add on the top of the uh, Brando's point when he mentioned uh, that it is there. So global digital trust is there. We have already uh, discussed that with global bodies like the UN and uh, OECD, for example, with IEEE, with uh, the UNESCO. And I was uh, one of those members in the ad hoc expert groups for the uh, UNESCO recommendation uh, ethics on AI, which is the first, I would say, global standards on AI. And we've, we were like around 24 multi-stakeholder group and they are from different regions, from different backgrounds. And I, you could expect the, the conflict in the opinions, the conflict in choosing the, the principles, the conflict in choosing the values, the distinguished between the, those values and, and principles. So within the, those discussions and arguments and negotiations, we reach those common, I would say, principles and policy actions. And when it comes to policy actions, also there is a lot of approaches that you could do to, to, for, to tackle certain principles. And uh, as you know, for UNESCO's uh, recommendation uh, ethics on AI has been adopted by 193 uh, member states. So it is possible to bring out those global uh, thinking and apply it to uh, your, your own uh, country or to your national measures. How to apply it to your national measures? Then we have to consider your own uh, principles, your own values, your own cultural norms, and, up, and reflect it on, those, uh, on the global principles, and select from those global principles what's exactly important to you and important to your existing uh, legislations. Um, in Saudi, uh, for example, we were one of those first countries who implemented uh, the UNESCO's uh, recommendation ethics on AI. We have selected those principles that, we, that is very important to us. We are making sure that the implementation of those principles are tackled throughout the, the development life cycle. We have selected the governance body who will uh, really look after those uh, principles within the other government entities and providing incentives also for those government entities to work on that one. Um, um, before two months, uh, in July, uh, the Prime Minister also called for um, uh, the International uh, AI Research and Ethics uh, Center that will be in Saudi Arabia to, to keep on those global dialogues and global discussions around AI research risks and uh, ethical directions. So, yes, it is possible, and uh, you can normalize it to your own needs, and uh, move on and keep on the exchanging of the knowledge and practices. Thank you very much. We do still have a little bit of time, so maybe we can expand on, on, on a few questions. Um, as somebody that works for a government, we, we uh, are following and participating in quite a large number of intergovernmental organizations and also other organizations that develop guidance either for governments or for regulators. 
Um, and of course, the Interparliamentary Union is, is a very useful body, but it's not specialized in particular issues like, like other in, in international organizations. So w w how, how would, would it be useful to you if the ITU, UNESCO, but also others like OECD or, or, or other specialized uh, uh, entities that deal with particular issues, if, if, if uh, or uh, those dealing with climate uh, or, or dealing with health issues where you have data and AI also in the WMO, WHO and so on, if, the, if they would be more in close contact, not just with the states and the governments and the regulators, but also with the parliamentarians, would you think that would be something that would be useful? For you, that's one one question that uh, that I'm, I'm I'm asking myself if I listen to you, and and uh, yeah, I'll let it be for this one. And maybe you have what 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 is the guidance that you would, because the EU is is a big is a big construct. You can hire many experts uh, to 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 look into issues, but maybe smaller countries or developing countries have less resources to task and and pay experts. So what is the guidance that you would? ask from the UN system and other, and other intergovernmental or international institutions? Definitely. Um, similar to the line that you were mentioning, I think it would be very useful um, if the UN body and a lot of other platforms would work a lot more closely with the parliamentarians. Um, at least in Nepal, we, uh, we have government that changes quite frequently, so what's really stable are the parliamentarians that you have in position for five years. Um, so that is a decent time to work on something and institutionalize it, so that gives it a continuity, number one. And number two is similar to what you said, um, in, in low resource setting, it's very uh, important to have access to what I said earlier, knowledge pots, in terms of what has been done, what are different frameworks that different countries have applied, and to learn from them and to see which one can then be taken and contextualized for our countries. So I think it'll be very useful to have a much stronger parliamentarian track um, and parliamentarian interactions with various platforms and with the UN organizations. And I think it's the third thing to act, uh, add on to what I said earlier is um, we need to step a little bit back from a very sectoral approach, right? Uh, health, WHO, this, that organization, and have a lot more collective conversation. So we remove duplications from within the UN system as well. And then there is a lot more uh, cohesive approach to data in general. How do we think about data in general instead of just thinking health data or climate change data? So that would create uniformity and this minimum uh, standard, which can then be contextualized for each sector. I think that will be useful. Thanks. Do you all agree, or is there something you would like to add? <laughs> I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's our experience also. I, 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 I think I, I, I agree, but uh, maybe um, it would be important also to learn a bit one from another in the sense that there are very well um, advanced forms of cooperation with some of these organizations, while others, the, also among the ones you listed, uh, there is more uh, sparse, more uh, um, seldom uh, um, uh, consultation. Um, so I, I think we, we, we can uh, also learn uh, from the best examples. So, and I, I, I have seen these also working on, on AI, and I think that uh, we, can, we can, again, try to, to get uh, it more streamlined to some extent. Um, I think I think I have answered this question before. Maybe I mentioned some some uh, uh, ideas for the IPU to to work on, and uh, something else that I would like to add: it, when when those uh, global bodies like UN or uh, uh, UNESCO or others who's working on glo forming global direction, it is very important to consider parliamentarian here. It's not the, like parliamentarian track that brings all the uh, IP, uh, IPU members or for, for discussion. It's also for providing uh, insights f for the recommendations or any documents that, uh, or any governance, global governance direction that uh, 
a certain uh, organization is working on. Here, it will, that the involvement of parliamentarians will be very important as well. Thank you. And, and maybe another question that is, uh, you have answered, but only to some extent in, in the first question, given that we are, we are facing a, a really rapid change uh, in technology, but also that we don't have like n older new technologies like cars or other things that you buy something and it remains stable for years, it doesn't change, given that, that the software, that the AI systems change almost daily. And for instance, in my country, like working out the law in Switzerland normally takes about five years. And then if uh, some people don't like it, they can challenge it. It goes to a referendum. And if the people say no, then it takes another five years for, this, for another version. So if, if, if legislating takes several years and technology keeps changing and we have new applications that pop up, how, and we, have, we never have like a finished product. We are living in a better uh, version world. How do we, how do we refl reflect this in, in, in in legislation, of course, you said we should not uh, legislate the technology or regulate technology, but its impact. But if the technology changes, how can we go also to a kind of creating better version laws that you can constantly adapt instead of having laws that take five or even more years to elaborate? What, what is your vision? What do you discuss among parliamentarians how this, this very lengthy process should, can be speeded up? It's not only in the Switzerland. <laughs> it's everywhere. As we it depends on the, the type of law, it's especially when we are talking about um, technology and uh, data. We, we spent almost 10 years in, in just providing the P PTBL uh, for, um, in, in our country. So the idea is, um, I will go back to it again, it's we need to move in parallel. Uh, we should have this long term that will take the 10 years or 10 years plus uh, draft. And while we are building this draft, and everyone should work on this draft. So from, from today, all the, all, all the parliaments, if you didn't start writing the draft, you have to. Because you don't know whenever you will need it and you, when, it, when you need to enforce it. So it should be there. However, on the, on the short term track, regulatory sandboxes. It's very important. The following up from those regulatory sandboxes in order to draft the law is very important. Otherwise, we don't know how to uh, really uh, cover or um, uh, tackle all those aspects from the technology that is changing while we, are the, while we didn't actually finish <laughs> the first draft of the law. Yeah, yeah thank I you. So you say you need to work on, on several layers or, or time spans one is the longer term, more sustainable regulation, and the other one is more allowing for experimenting in defined areas that help you to gain experience. Yes. Well, okay. I, I go a bit along the lines in the sense that uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, uh, as it was said, uh, time spans, but also the kind of instruments that we use, because we do not have just laws. We can also think of more... Um, um, uh, kind of soft uh, legislation and uh, frameworks that can be adapted uh, uh, um, gradually. It depends on what you need to do. Um, clearly, uh, I give you an example. When you need to, uh, I mean, to overcome a fragmentation of, of rules, uh, and uh, that's a typical thing looking at the European Union, the fragmentation of the internal market. You need a legislation that is solid because it needs to uh, avoid uh, uh, the fact that you uh, fragment the internal market. But on other uh, aspects, you can also rely on more executive um, um, actions um, with uh, some degree of scrutiny from, from parliament. Uh, this is something that could be applied also to other contexts, and I think we need to be... Um, uh, flexible in this sense because the the, the, the issue of timing is crucial. Uh, as I uh, believe in 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 democracy, I think that for it to be appreciated by people, it needs to work, and it needs to work. It needs to be on 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 in time with the challenges, and this is not always the case. So 
just adding on to what Brandon said, I think we've got uh, different toolkits. In Nepal, we, uh, an executive can bring a law that's active for 60 days for then for parliament to bring a replacement law. Um, so for something that is threatening to the national security, uh, if it's pertaining to technology, that we can definitely bring a law that's active for 60 days. It's also possible to bring regulations. Regulations are quite powerful. For example, when cryptocurrency really was taking off. Um, and Nepal is a closed loop economy uh, when it comes to foreign currency. Um, the government basically banned it, right? Because we didn't understand what it was. We didn't understand its volatility. We didn't understand what was behind it. We just didn't understand blockchain technology. Um, so there are a lot of tools available to deal with uh, rapidly changing technology, but I think the key really is to uh, be proactive and to remain connected with the researchers, with the academia, uh, with the innovators to understand what's coming up in the horizon. And that, I think, is, is the key to uh, remaining not too far behind new innovations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we, we do have a few minutes left, so if, if you agree, we could also, since there are mics, give the floor to people in the audience if they have questions or issues they would like to address to you as parliamentarians. That may be an occasion that some people would want to seize. So if, yes, please introduce yourself and then uh, make your comment or ask your question. Thank you very much. My name is Sam, Honorable Sam George. I'm a member of parliament from Ghana. I think that the statements that have been made and the sentiments that have been shared are things we agree largely, but as a member of parliament from Africa, I'm looking at, I think I can associate closer with Nepal on, on the platform. Saudi Arabia is not a developing economy and they've got the wealth to push their agenda. The European parliament has got as strength as Europe. I'm beginning to ask myself, uh, most of the platforms that we deal with, that we want to have the trusted internet on, are based either in Europe or America. Since 2019, when we've been having this uh, parliamentary track, I haven't seen a US congressman attend, a US congressman attend any of the IGF sessions. And they pass the legislations for their platforms that creates the distrust and mistrust that we have on, on the continent. So I'd want to find out, for example, and yesterday at the parliamentary track session, I spoke about the US Cloud Act. Now that was passed by the US Congress. That puts African parliamentarians and African internet users at risk because we run on this US-based platforms. So if we really want to have a trusted internet and we want to build global standards, we want to find out how the African perspective comes into building of these platforms when the legislations that are passed don't look at us uh, and take in, into consideration our local values, our norms, and our culture. It's also important for us to understand that in building a trusted platform or internet, we need to just not look at non-state actors, but non-state actors that are linked with state actors, especially looking at 2024 which is a critical year on the African continent. It's the year of elections. It's a year of democracy. My country, Ghana, is going to be running elections in 2024 and about 70 other democracies across the world. Now, if you look at non-state actors linked to countries like North Korea, like China, like Russia, and the US, and the issues of disinformation and misinformation, and the fact that many of our political parties are going to be picking operations or operative, election operatives from these countries to help us run elections, and they're the ones who are gonna be pushing this disinformation, we need to begin to have conversations and being able to call out non-state actors that are linked to state actors and saying to them, to have a safer internet, these players have to take up the responsibility of ensuring that we fight disinformation. I don't see any African government getting actively or having the capacity to execute disinformation without help from these big players. And these platforms need to have a responsibility. But that said, I'm not going to end without putting some responsibility on African parliamentarians and Africa as a continent. Because I look at Europe, and Europe does it as a collective, not as individual member states. 
And so we need to see more action from the Pan-African Parliament and the African Union, the AUC, taking a collective stand on the African Union development uh, data policy frameworks to ensure that as a continent, we have a collective voice to then bring these big tech players to the, to, to the table to have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, um, well, since, since you're a member of the parliamentarian track, of course, you may ask the organizers of the parliamentarian track that they should try and do more to get uh, Congress people or parliamentarians from, from uh, the United States and, and maybe other countries in, in too. So uh, <laughs> I don't think we can answer the question, but feel free to react, of course. I would just like to echo, and I completely understand small countries, developing countries, we don't have the collective bargaining that EU has um, to put in place a lot of regulations that it has. But if Nepal is unsafe, so is a lot of other countries. We truly are boundaryless when it comes to internet, right? So I think it is a collective conversation we need to have about how do we manage, how do we tackle these common social evils of misinformation, disinformation, and, and, and vital going fake news. Um, I think that is what I feel we need to advocate for, is what are some of the minimum standards that we all need to abide by? What are some of the content moderation regulation we need to place uh, wherever all these large tech platforms operate? Um, how do we bring about parity? So especially small companies that are trying to innovate in this space are already very far behind. Um, they don't have access to as much data that has been mined in all these years. What are some of the things we can do to truly uh, enable innovations in countries like ours? So completely echo with you. And I feel like what we need to do is collectively advocate for some minimum standards that is going to keep uh, citizens in low resource setting also safe. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we can take one more, I would say. Namaste, everyone. This is Vivek Silwal from Nepal for the record. So uh, this was a very interesting session uh, from the honorable MPs. A lot is being done, and a lot is, is being needed to be done in coming days to, create, to make the internet more open and accessible. But my question is, as a parliamentarian, as a policymaker, how do you plan to indulge youth in this process that you multiply the effect of creating the trust. So with that, my question is to each MPs, how in your region you are engaging the youths or you plan to engage in coming days to have this internet more secure and more trustable? Thank you. Thank you, that's a very good question. How do you bring in youth, you as parliamentarians? Thank you. Well, um, I, I try to connect uh, uh, this specific area of interest to a larger issue for young uh, uh, people and so potentially young voters, but also in general young people that could be engaged in, in political, social discussions. I try to give a clear message that if they do not engage, they do not care, and it's also the duty of the institutions and society to give them the instruments to be involved, but if they refuse to do it, then others will do in their place. All the political forces, all the institutions fill their mouths with words about uh, the centrality of young people, that they are not the future, not the future, the present, they even say, but uh, it's, it's uh, unfortunately often fake because if you have a system where for elections, for uh, existing power, everything is in the hands of the older generations and it's also some phy physiological aspect. In some kinds, in some situations it's pathological, but uh, to some extent is physiological. Um, you need to convince them that they need to be part of the um, process. Because otherwise, there will be a lot of good words about young people. Because who, who would ever say, I don't care about young people. I care all, only about the older generations. No, no politician will say that. But uh, this doesn't matter 
it, it, if, if, if the ones that decide are only the older people, young people will be with their interest, with their needs, they will be expelled by the public discourse and everything will be just rhetoric and just uh, images, but not reality. So I try to be a bit brutal with them on, on this fact because I, I see that on such a big topic like the climate change, young people were able to unite globally and shake politics, shake institutions. I think it's very important that they do the same and they are doing it partially, but with less uh, I can say uh, momentum. They should be build more momentum around uh, digital citizenship, digital rights, uh, and the development of a global understanding on the internet, on the AI. I think uh, young generations can really contribute very much, and we need to, to push them to be more, uh, more engaged. I completely echo what you're saying in terms of there is not Look, so my personal story is I'm a first-time parliamentarian. I've been in parliament for eight months. Before that, I was completely in private sector. I joined politics, formal politics, because I no longer believed um, that the older generation is going to do anything substantial when it comes to climate change, when it comes to a lot of uh, vices that exist, that there is inherent uh, interest to not act on these aspects. So I think it's very important to act um, and that's one of the things that I try to do, to inspire uh, people who are not actively engaging in this dialogue to do that. There are two ways in which um, I've tried to do that. One is breaking down. I, I think it's the jargons that really put off. It's a lot of really big statements that put off younger generation. So breaking it down uh, for them, what this particularly, particular policy would mean in their day-to-day -day life, what this what the lack of this policy would mean for them in their day-to-day -day life. I think that is the first uh, way to way in which I have tried to engage. We call it legalese, legal Nepali. Um, so breaking down legalese into very common day-to-day -day, uh, sentences. And then the second thing is to really try to encourage them, just like Brandon, you said, um, if you don't set the narrative now, somebody else will, and it will be so difficult to change that narrative 15 years down the line when it would really, really start to hurt. Um, so those two way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, plus one to, both, to all of them. They have already mentioned what I want to, to clarify. And, and so I think the case is also uh, different because the majority is the youth, where the majority are under the age of 30. So everything we are working on is working for them and with them. So in, in, this, in this case, from all the sectors, we are tackling all the requirements for the youth and absolutely considering their opinions in all uh, the directions. Yes, thank you. And I must say, the, the, these three parliamentarians here are probably a, a below the average age of a parliamentarian. Um, we, we know this from big countries, also in the West, where you see parliamentarians that are way older, but also in Europe you have sometimes, but also, the, like, of course, Saudi Arabia has a different age distribution than, than, than other countries. So let's take one final comment or questions, and then and one final round of comments, and then we close. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Umar Khan uh, from Pakistan. Uh, I have a question from the lady next, sitting next to the moderator as she belongs to a law background. I also belong to a law background. Uh, my question is, uh, as Jeb says, all about the uh, access to internet. But if we can see sometimes the governments or the state just for the political benefits or gains blackout or shut down the internet. So when we say access is to internet is one of the fundamental right of the every human, so just shut downing, black out of the internet for the political gains, what internet governance can do, what regulation can be bring by the internet governance by this platform just to tackle the issue with the concerned governments. Like in my country this year, there was a complete blackout of for at least three to four days just for political gains. Or taking those rights from the people who are educacy digitally, so what IGF can do, really do in this regards, can 
what regulation can we bring and how can it be implemented? So I'm, I'm not sure what... Yeah, what's, it, what's your what, question what the, exactly? What the question so is, we know that... My question uh, is, if we say that access to internet is one of the right, human right... Access then, to internet. Yes, access yeah. to internet. Then blackout of the internet by the state just for the political gains, what regulations, laws can be brought by the IGF or what implementation can be done by the IGF in this regards when we say access to internet is one of the right of human? Uh, yes, we are as parliamentarians consider the access to the internet for all, all the... Internet shutdown, I'm asking for the internet shutdown. Yes. Uh, internet by shutdown. The, by the state, yes. By the state. Yes. Uh, so, in, in our case, we don't have the, we don't have, uh, the, 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 the issues of having the internet shut down. But what ex your question is, what can the parliamentarians in, in general do when it comes to, uh, to internet shutdown? Yes, in, the, in case of the political instability in the country, okay. uh, the state or the government acting in the state just for the political gains and or to put the opposition or the people, uh, so they just... Uh, there is shut, out, shut down in Pakistan last year. So what regulation or rules or the laws can be brought in this regards for the state to not cut the people from the access of internet? I think such questions should be answered by the IPU with, with countries with similar problems. So, the, 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 so the, you can, you can uh, for, for that that's interest, you can be, like take the best practices of what can others uh, do and in order to not to uh, control the accessibility of the internet, no matter what. Maybe if I if I can add to this, I think there are several aspects to to, to the question of. Uh, I'm, 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 this is my 18th IGF, and, and in the early IGFs, the question whether there should be a right to be connected to the internet and to telecom was it has disappeared somehow. It has at some point in time turned to be whether there should be a right to be disconnected, but that's something else. But if you if you take the human rights in terms of right to freedom of expression and freedom to information, um, that is something that is widely accepted. But then the question is, is there a right to have access, to have a free access in the sense for not having to pay for it? So there's also an economic question. What is, what is the right? Is it the right to communicate? But do you have the right to choose every means for free? You may have to pay for newspapers. You may have to pay for television and so on. So this is one of the elements. And the other one is, and there are in, in, in different regions, there are different provisions, um, different, <clears throat> let's say, restrictions that you can apply to freedom of expression or freedom of, of information. For instance, in Europe, um, you can restrict freedom of expression, freedom of information under certain conditions that need to be laid out by laws on national level that need to be in conformity with, with the Human Rights Convention. But there are, there are moments under certain conditions where you can restrict uh, uh, certain communications in emergency situations, but they need to be clearly defined and previsible. And, and then also there is normally a discussion around was this the right measure appropriate? Was it really an emergency situation? So there's a review on whether or not these, these laws have been applied. But this is... Uh, a European approach that I'm familiar with may be different in, in other areas. I don't well, know I would say one of the, the executive body usually have a lot of resources and they are able to make the decision, that's the executive body, right? But once they do that, then I think it's the job of parliamentarians and you should expect that of your parliamentarian to hold the government accountable to ask precisely this set of questions. Was it absolutely necessary? Did you have an alternative? If you had an alternative, why, why did you go for that, right? And let the democratic process kick in if uh, fundamental rights were encroached and let this wiping clear of the slate happen during the elections. I, I would say the standard that you should hold your parliamentarians accountable is to really hold the government accountable for its action. I, I, I really agree with what was just said. I think it's, that's the point. I mean, could it, could it be done differently? Could, was that proportionate to the objective that was uh, uh, maybe a legitimate objective, but was that proportionate? Because 
sometimes uh, this is the way you, you, you start uh, degrading the freedom of access to internet, that you uh, use uh, a, f a f some excuse linking it to uh, some legitimate issue, and in the end it's, like you said, a political uh, gain, a political gain or game even, <laughs> um, to, uh, that in the end is at the detriment of, 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 of a principle that I think we should try to, to build some common understanding, that uh, uh, limiting the freedom of the internet uh, should be proportionate to really uh, um, significant uh, reasons that could also justify in general limits to freedom of expression, which seems to me a really, really delicate topic where uh, there should be some uh, work to, to build common, common understanding. And today we see the efforts to separate internet in some cases, to talk about the division of the internet. But I think that this context where we are is instead going in the opposite direction, that we should have a um, a united internet for a, a more united world that can, can work together. Thank you. Thank you. I think these are the perfect words uh, to end the session. I'm sorry the time is over, but I'm sure that you uh, have a chance to meet and talk to the parliamentarians present at the IGF here. And I think the, this is definitely uh, an value added for the IGF but also for the parliamentarians, and I hope that we can expand it, and I hope that next time we have also people from the U.S. Congress, parliamentarians from the U.S. Uh, parliaments uh, here <laughs> to exchange uh, with them. So thank you all for the very interesting uh, debate, and I've been learning a lot about uh, what is important for parliamentarians. Thank you very much. <laughs>